First of all, do you have any questions about last lecture? Any question about the smoothness? Any problem about that? So now I think we are ready to talk about the gradient method. So our goal is to minimize f of x over the whole space Rn. Uh, I think the b is out, right? Okay. And uh, the algorithm is as simple as this. So we begin with an initial point x0, any point in Rn. And then you do these uh, iterative steps for k iterations from 0 to k minus 1. Uh, in the first step, Every, in every iteration, first step, you choose the step size h sub k, which is positive, and then you do this gradient step. Basically, you start from xk and do a, a go along the negative uh, gradient direction with this long uh, step size. So you arrive at the new search point, and then you do this iteratively. In the end, you will find the point x capital k, right? So we output x capital k. And then we are going to show some convergence property about this point in terms of function value. Any question about the algorithm? It's very clear, right?
So we first state the general result. This is for any iterate k. Uh, for any x k, we have such a bound on the primal gap. And also it holds for the last point x capital k. So the condition is when f is convex and l smooth. L smooth is the condition we introduced last time. And here the subsize is always taken as a constant subsize. H and H is in between 0 and 2 over L. This is crucial for the convergence. And then basically the algorithm generates a sequence satisfying this inequality for every iteration. Okay, so we first define a new quantity called RK. at the uh, rk plus 1 square. By definition, it's xk plus 1 minus x star square. And then using the step 2 here. Here we just uh, plug in the definition of xk plus 1 from step 2. And then notice the square of this term is just rk. All right, so we uh, expanded the square term. So we have rk Here, just expanded the square term. Here we just uh, add a negative uh, gradient at x star because this is zero, right? This is the automatic condition. Uh, let's, let's prove this later. So we are going to show whenever your function f is convex and also there is a point x star such that the gradient at this point is zero, then it means this point x star is a global minimum for the function f if you are minimizing over the whole space Rn. Uh, let's leave this as a question mark. Why this is why when, why uh, it holds? So when, when it's zero, then this is a minimum. Why this holds? Right. Let's leave this as a question mark. Are we going, I'm going to show that later. But let's assume this is zero, right? Because this is the supreme point, and when it's convex and unconstrained, this is the global minimum. So with this. Uh, Recall we had a line map last time. This is exactly the statement four we proved the last time. So let's try to use this lemma, this inequality here. Taking x as xk, taking y as x star. So this expression in the product here is the same as this one. So we can continue further.
Okay. So the x, uh, h square is here, right? h square. And this term, uh, you're going to have minus 2h over l. That's here, minus 2h over l. The reason why we ignore this one again, because this is zero, right? So we use this fact twice. We ignore it here. Okay. Uh, noting that h is between 0 and uh, 2 over l. So this product here is positive. Right? So it means rk plus 1 is strictly, it's just less than or equal to rk square. Right? So it means uh, if you are performing gradient method, then the distance from your current iterate to the optimal solution is decreasing. Right, this is a, RK is a decreasing sequence, not increasing. Okay, now let's define a new quantity. This inequality is due to the complexity of f, right? If you use a definition here, uh, you can check this is basically the complexity. Basically, it's a definition of complexity when f is differentiable. Right? So this is by complexity, and here it's by Cauchy-Schwarz. You have a two inner product, so you have the product of two uh, norms, and the norm of this one is just R k by definition. And the next step is because R k is non-decreasing. Oh, sorry, RK is not increasing. Just uh, using this effect here, right? RK is less than to R0. Recall the first statement we had last time. Uh, actually, this should be the second. Using this result, we have uh, fxk plus 1. So taking y to be xk plus 1, taking x to be xk. the fact that xk plus 1 minus xk, uh, this is equal to minus h gradient at xk. Right? This is step 2 in the algorithm.
then in these two terms, you will have this factor alpha here. Alpha is h times 1 minus LH over 2. And uh, because h is no more than 2 over L, so this is positive, right? You can verify this is positive. Um, it should be minus uh, the less than or equal to FXT minus. Here. Now we put this term to the right. Oh, sorry, sorry. Right, this plus. Okay, so here, uh, from this inequality, we see a descent property of the distance, right? RK is non increasing. And from here, we can see a descent property of the function value, because this term is non-negative. So fx k plus 1 is no more than fx k. So both function value and the distance from x k to x star, they are non-increasing. And now let's subtract the fx star. So we have, uh, basically, if you subtract fx star, using definition here, we have delta k plus 1. That's not good to delta k. Then let's try to use this inequality. Let's call it one. So by one we have This is just by using one here, plugging one into here. So now this is purely a recursive formula about delta k and delta k plus one. So it's just al algebra afterwards. We do not need to uh, worry about the algorithm. So it, the task for us now is to analyze the emergence of uh, this delta k sequence. So the trick is by dividing the whole inequality by this product. So we divide the whole thing by this product. Then we work with the inverse. So then we have del 1 over delta k, 1 over delta k plus 1. Because uh, here we also need to note that delta k plus 1 is less than equal to delta k. Right? So here, this is no more than, so this part is uh, greater than or equal to 1. So we can continue in this direction. Let's put it to the other side. So let's rearrange the terms. We have 1 over delta k plus 1. And now let's uh, do a summation over k. Then we finally have 1 over delta k greater than equal to 1 over delta 0 plus alpha k r0 square. Okay. And now uh, yeah. 
And recall that this delta k is fxk minus fx star. And let me just, and this rk, this r0 here is uh, x0 minus x star. Delta 0 is fx0 minus fx star. Then you just reinvert, uh, just invert this inequality. After some algebraic uh, manipulation, we recovered the goal here. Right? So here is just the delta 0, r0, r0, delta 0, r0, delta 0. This, de this is delta k. So we have all the uh, objects here. Just do an inversion of this inequality and recover, right? So that's the end of this proof. Any questions? Here we take the subsides hk to be h as a constant, but we don't specify uh, which h is the best, right? So because it depend the performance really depends on the, the subsides. In, the, in this algorithm, we have no other uh, freedom other than this subsides choice, right? The, how to do the gradient step is fixed. You so just take a, a gradient and then go along the negative gradient direction. The only freedom is the, long, the length of your step size. So let's see how we can um, optimize the performance of this algorithm. That is by maximizing the denominator, right? So that we can have a faster convergence. So the dependence on h in the denominator is just uh, this function here. It's a quadratic function about h. It's h times 2 minus lh. Right, and this is uh, maximized when, when the gradient derivative is zero. So let's take the uh, derivative. This is two minus two l h. So this means if this is zero, then this means your h is one over l. One over l is just the, the midpoint of this range. But if you take h as that, then you can uh, optimize the performance here. So in this case, if we take h uh, as one over l. And uh, we use one more inequality about the smoothness. This inequality is again using the fact over here. Right? We take y to be x0 and take x to be x star. And here, this identity is due to the fact that the gradient at x star is just 0. So using this choice of your step size and using this inequality again, plugging back into this convergence result, then we finally have a simplified result. This is a corollary. If we take hk to be 1 over k for every k written equal to 0. And again, assuming f is convex, f smooth. Then we have a much simpler bond on the primal gap.
So this shows uh, the convergence of your algorithm is basically at the rate of 1 over k. And this is a convergence rate, 1 over k. So using big O notation, the rate is 1 over little k. Right. Or if you output the final point, this is 1 over capital K, but the K is arbitrary. And if you want to find an epsilon solution, so if you want this one, bond this one to be no more than epsilon, then it gives you K plus 4. So this is, uh, if you just solve this inequality, it will give you K plus 4 greater than or equal to 2L x0 minus x star square over epsilon. But this is, yep. Sorry, uh, the, the inequality on the bottom, should that be f of x star plus L over 2 uh, radius? The, the very bottom there. Uh, because otherwise, if, if it's f of x not on both oh, yeah. sides, then it's Starbucks. trivial. I just want to make sure. This, yeah. The star is inherited from here. Yeah. Yes, you're right. Thanks. Uh, so if you solve this inequality, we get this bond on k. Um, and this, this will be a sufficient condition. So we just say k is on the order of capital of O big O of uh, 1 over epsilon. This plus 4 is not important here. And if you are only interested in the dependence on epsilon, you can ignore the constant here. This is as the uh, example I gave when we talk about the uh, sublinear convergence rate. Gradient method has sublinear convergence rate. If it's strongly convex, then we will have a better convergence rate. The dependence on epsilon will be log 1 over epsilon. But that's when we have a mu strong convexity. Any This is basically the optimality condition when function f is convex and uh, continuously differentiable. We are looking for a point uh, such that the gradient is zero. Uh, previously, the proof is for, uh, we are looking for a function value that is small compared with the minimum. The, differ the difference is no more than a tolerance epsilon, which is small. And we are sometimes we are also interested in finding a point such that the gradient is small. This is usually called a stiffering point. Well, when it's convex, uh, then this point is special. It's also the global minimum. But when it's non-convex, 
This could be a local minimum or saddle point. So for example, if this is a non-convex function, so all these points have zero gradient, but they are not, uh, but not all of them are uh, global minimum. Only this one is, this is global minimum. So this is a local minimum, this is a local maximum. What is the continuously differentiable? So basically here, we are just looking for a point, uh, a, a function, um, Basically, it means the derivative is continuous. But here, uh, currently, we are interested in some uh, well uh, conditioned function that is not like, uh, for example, the absolute value function. It's not con the de uh, derivative is not continuous at this point, but at other points, it's continuous. We are just looking for a smooth function because here, the derivative from this direction is minus one, this direction is plus one, but here it can be anything. So it's not continuous. This is a nice smooth function. And uh, we, are, we are going to introduce a sub method for solving such function. But for solving a smooth function, we can use gradient method. That's the place where gradient method is applicable. The proof is quite simple. We basically use the max t, which is like uh, the inequality here. This is the max state inequality by definition, and uh, since this gradient is zero, so this is just fx star, right? And because this is for any x in Rn, so any function value, the function value at any point x is uh, at least this much. So this is the global minimum, right? So. This is the automatic condition. So sometimes we are also interested in finding a point such the gradient is small, the norm is small. So we're looking for some point x such that this is small. But uh, I think we are not going to cover it in the lecture. This will be a homework uh, problem in homework one that will be released uh, tomorrow uh, on Thursday. So this is looking for a small gradient norm. The proof there will be based on the proof we gave here about the function value. As we mentioned just now, the convergence rate of a gradient method for convex function is just 1 over k, and the complexity to find the epsilon solution is 1 over epsilon. And it can be improved when the function is a uh, better condition. That's when it's uh, strongly convex. So let's introduce uh, strong convexity. Remember that for convex function, we have three definitions. One is for function value. Uh, the second one is based on the gradient, when it's smooth, when it's differentiable. And the last one is based on the Hessian, when it's secondary differentiable. So for strongly convex, we are going to have the three counterparts as well. So the first definition is only based on zero order information, the function value. So f is mu strongly convex.
This is quite similar to the convex definition if you take mu to be zero or just ignore this negative quadratic term here, right? This is the uh, convex combination of two function values is greater than or equal to the function value of the convex combination of these two points. Here we are just making the statement stronger. So if you subtract something, I'm still greater than or equal to the that function value of the convex combination points. And uh, the one that I subtract is depending on the parameter mu. This is a strong convexity. So if you take mu to be zero, this recovers a convex definition. And that's how you can view the two definitions together in a unified way. So when f is convex, you can also view it as a zero strongly convex function. How does the geometry of the function look relative to just a simply convex problem? You can view it as, so there is another uh, uh, result saying that if f minus mu over 2 is convex, then uh, f is mu strongly convex. So if you subtract the quadratic from your function, and it's still convex, then it's at least the mu strongly convex. So I'm thinking, you know, uh, the convex function is like, like a, a quadratic. Like like quadratic. If, if, it's a uh, if you subtract the quadratic from that, what, ha what happens to the shape? Of that? Example, this is, suppose this is Right. Yeah. And you subtract. That's called gx. So this is again a convex function. So you at least have some uh, quadratic term in it. But this can be um, beyond quadratic. It can be. Gotcha. So, yeah, we're going to talk about the definite. When we talk about definite three, it will be clear. So this can mu can be the smallest eigenvalue of your Hessian. The second definition is based on the gradient information. I think it's mu strongly convex and continuously differentiable if. We don't have the quadratic term. It's again the definition for a convex function. So this is uh, nothing but strengthening the original convex function. But we add a quadratic. And this actually is the definition. Uh, sorry, this is the proof for the statement I just made. Uh, you can subtract the mu quadratic here and subtract the mu quadratic here as well. Y. And here you subtract the uh, mu uh, this is plus. So you can subtract here, subtract here, and add something here. Then this is basically like rearranging, just decompose this term into three terms and put it back. Right? If you define G We're just proving this inequality, and this is convexity. This is just some algebra. This term can be decomposed into these three terms. Here is an inner product. And verify this.
The third definition is based on the Hessian. When the function, uh, when the Hessian of f is uh, at least mu times an identity, so when the smallest n value is at least a mu, then the function is mu strongly convex. And uh, when, when both conditions hold, it's mu strongly convex. Um, so we mentioned before the condition number kappa is l over mu. L is the smoothness of a function, mu is the strong convexity. Uh, here you can, suppose a function is twice differentiable, twice continuous differentiable. You can view this more directly. L is the maximum of the eigenvalue of uh, Uh, this is for any x. Mu is the smallest uh, eigenvalue of hash and f. And so the, uh, the condition number kappa is just a ratio between the largest and the smallest eigenvalue. Largest eigenvalue uh, somehow means the so when you apply a matrix onto a vector, you can rotate the vector and also scale the vector, right? So maximum value in some sense just means uh, how long you can stretch the vector. And this value means uh, how much you can uh, compress the vector. So this ratio gives you the condition number. I'm going to state two lemmas, but we are not going to prove them. The proof are left as homework problem, but uh, these lemmas are going to be used uh, in the convergence analysis for mu strongly convex function when we use a greedy method to solve it, minimize it.
This is the first lemma. This is a uh, format is quite similar to the one we had for uh, smoothness. We are interested in inner products and the difference between gradients, difference between the points. So I, this is in the same format as uh, smoothness condition. For example, here we have the gradient is lower bound. The difference gradient is lower bounded by mu times the difference of the points. For smoothness, smoothness we have uh, this is less than or equal to L times x minus y. Right, so they're pretty much in the same format. And from here, you can see when the function is mu surrounding convex and L smoothness, uh, comparing this in the, this part and the, the last part, you will see mu is no more than L. And this somehow verifies uh, the condition number should be greater than or equal to zero, greater than or equal to one. Mu is always no more than L. This is again for any x, y, r, n. So this is only for mu surrounding convex function, but here we are assuming the function is both surrounding convex and smooth. And in this case, um, in this case we have a this stronger result. This is stronger than the one we had for the smooth case, I think. Yeah, for example, if you take mu to be zero, this part goes away. Here, only one over L is left. And that's one of the inequalities we had for the smoothness case, for smooth case. And if we take uh, an inequality to rectangle, well. and So with all this preparation, now we are ready to show the convergence of a gradient method applied on a strongly convex function. Yes. Yeah. So I just all these definitions are like single direction implications, and I'm curious, like, if you just know that a function is is mu strongly convex. Like you can't say any of these things yes. about it. Yeah. So like, what can you say about it? If like all that you know is a fun, is a function is mu strongly convex. Um, like these these are conditions for. Oh, if it's mu strongly convex, then the reverse direction also holds. Oh, th so these are by conditions. Yes. Okay. Yes.
this is kappa. Here is kappa minus one, kappa plus one. Kappa is L over mu. From here we can see this is a linear convergence we are looking for, right? This is a linear convergence rate. Any questions before we do the proof? We again light Rk to be Xk minus X star. And then consider the same quantity, Rk plus 1, as before. This is the same calculation uh, to H. This is the same calculation as in the convex case. Oh, okay. Actually, we can do it here. Just uh, put the active gradient x star here. Right, this is the one we had before. And then we try to use this inequality here. Because this gives us in the product is greater than or equal to something. So the negative is less than or equal to something. That's the direction we are looking for. This is simply using this inequality with x to be xk, uh, y to be x star. And plug it back, uh, plug it back into this inequality we have, following one. From here, because h is in the range here, so this term is uh, Let's now go to zero. So again, here we can see Rk is not increasing. And we, we previously what we had is Rk, is, RK plus 1 is less than equal to Rk. But here, we also have a factor here. This factor is smaller than 1. That's how we have linear convergence rate. So we have this, previously we just have 1. Now we have something smaller than 1. And when mu is 0, this goes back to 1. So 
So if you apply this inequality recursively, you will have the first conclusion. So you will, you will have a power of k here. Right? This is rk, this is r0, rk square, r0 square, and you will have a power k. The first inequality is proof. And uh, the second one, second one is when we say h is 2 over mu, uh, 2 over mu plus l. So if you plug in h as 2 over mu plus l, So let's do some calculation. H is 2 mu plus L. This factor becomes 1 minus uh, 4 mu L. Mu plus L square. Right? And this becomes um, L over mu square L plus mu square right and divide the both numerator and denominator by mu have L over mu minus one L over mu plus one and L over mu is condition number kappa So you can take the square root, cancel the two, and then apply the recursively. You have the second conclusion. Any question? The last one. So the first two are about the distance from x k to x star, and the last one is between. Uh, it's a function value. So to prove from the second one to the third one, we need an inequality that uh, convert the any bound on the uh, distance to any bound on the primal gap. And uh, noting that here we basically use smoothness. So we need an inequality from the smoothness analysis. Um, and that is again by using this one that we always use for smooth so from here to here we just take y to be xk take x to be x star and noting that then this is x star, this is zero, right? So this goes away. So the function value, uh, this gap, this gap here is no more than l over two times whatever bound you have here. So just plug this bound back into here. Right? You need to take a square, square, square. So you have this inequality. Okay. So all the three are proved. Any questions? So far, we have talked about uh, 
optimization over the whole space Rn, right? Either for a smooth, a convex smooth function or for strongly convex smooth function. But sometimes we are also interested in minimizing over constraint. We are also interested in uh, minimizing f over a certain set. And if both function f and the set they are uh, convex, convex function f, convex set, then this is called convex programming. In the unconstrained case, the optimal condition is when the gradient is zero. But in the constrained case, we have a constrained set q. Uh, this is no longer the optimality condition. So let's take a simple example. Let's consider minimizing a univariate function. So this is a scalar. My only constraint is x gradient up to zero. So obviously the minimizer x star is zero, right? But my gradient, so let's call this is f of x. Uh, my derivative is always one. So at any point, I cannot find a, a gradient with a different a, der a derivative with a different value other than one. So if I'm looking for this, I get stuck. I cannot move from my initial point, right? But uh, uh, so that I cannot find, the, if I do not start from zero, I cannot find zero. So the optimality condition in this case, let's state it as a theorem. If the function is convex and uh, smooth, and the set is a closed and convex set, then uh, a point that is a solution to my constrained uh, problem, if and only if this condition holds. and x in q. Uh, let's just prove one direction. The other direction is in the node. So we prove direction uh, from, let's assume this is true. For Ix. Yeah, for, for Ix. I put it here. 
I put it above. Oh. Some people cannot see it. I put it above. So let's assume uh, that can. Let's assume this condition is true for any x in Q. So with that, we can say f of x. Right, this is because of uh, convexity. We are using convexity again. And because this is non negative, so this is greater than or equal to x star. And hence, x star is the, uh, a solution to the constraint pro problem. Because this is for this is for any x in Q, okay. and hence this is for any x in Q. The whole inequality, the one direction is obvious. The other one is a little bit more involved, but the, the complete proof is in the note. You can check that later. Okay, let's prove uh, one theorem. We will also leave this one to the to the node. You can check the proof in the node. This term is saying that when the function is mu strongly convex, then for any point x, we not only have f is greater than to f star, but we can also have some room for another quadratic. So it's a, also a way to strengthen the uh, optimality. So this term is very important here. It will appear again and again in many analyses, especially for all the proximal point methods, because for proximal point method, we are building a model, uh, so we first linearize some. Okay, let's do not linearize. So we, in proximal point method, we are interested in minimizing f. So the idea in proximal point is you have a certain point x k, some iterate you have before. And they want to build a, a model uh, m plus a quadrature so that you want with this model you can find a, a solution x k plus one. This can be either exact or inexact, can be an approximate solution. But the idea is to regularize the distance between x k plus one and x k by adding this quadratic and penalizing the distance, right? I don't want them to be far away. So by adding this quadratic, suppose this f is convex, it doesn't have to be strongly convex. By adding the quadratic, I'm making the whole function to be 1 over lambda strongly convex, right? Basically, you can just multiply this factor by 2, factor by 2. You have 1 over lambda strongly convex function. So, suppose you have a minimizer for this solution. For, for this problem, you have a minimizer. Let's call, it a, uh, call this whole function fx tilde, right? Then, Basically, we, we have the following result, f tilde, f tilde, and here is 1 over 2 lambda. You have a way to proceed. This is a basic inequality for proximal point method. Uh, I think we are just right on time. Let's stop here, and next time we are going to do a greedy method for constraint optimization and do the con uh, convergence analysis.
Her şeyi anlatıyor galiba. 